Hi everyone, so my name is Noreen O'Connell, my company is Optimized Foods Limited, so I work with food and beverage companies who are scaling up their operations, their products, their brands, their processes for overseas markets. My background is I spent 19 years in PepsiCo where I led the technical centres in PepsiCo supporting about 450 manufacturing operations and 300 products. So I just want to start with a few figures on innovation. So 70 to 90 percent of innovations fail inside one year and that's taken from Harvard in 2013. And if you look at the US where they publish a lot of figures, in the US now new products account for 50% of companies' revenues from sales. So what we are seeing happen is more and more products coming to market but with an extremely high failure rate. Now amazingly good products do fail and they fail for all sorts of reasons, poor design, technical issues, positioning, pricing, marketing, so lots of reasons products fail, not necessarily because it was a poor design in the first place. Um, Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about an innovation framework and what I've done here is I've pulled out the very first step and the very last step. So the very first step is your research pipeline and I want today to talk about the pre-development stage of innovation. And I'm also going to touch on portfolio management because you take a lot of data from your portfolio management back into your research pipeline. Now an awful lot is expected from your innovation process. So if you're in a company, whether you're a small company or a large company, you do need to have an innovation process. Something that's robust, that's structured, that's standardized. And you expect it to drive success in the market, to increase your speed to market, to make sure you get the design brief right. You want to make sure you have governance, that you have standards for replication because you want a consistent product on the market, and you also want to drive efficiency. So what I'm going to do is just have a look at, this is the innovation process that I use in my workshop. Um, all of the steps in the innovation process are relevant, however what you find is the, the order of them will vary depending on the company that you're in. I've highlighted areas in black here which are called stage gates and a stage gate is you really need to stop and ask yourself, okay, what do I need to do here? Do I need to tweak the product? Do I need to go back to the drawing board? Do I need more consumer studies? So you really need to have steps along the way where you step back and not rush through the process. A lot of companies firefight their way onto the shelf and don't have a, a structured approach to innovation. This is just an example. Every single step on the innovation process has a series of tasks behind that. So there's an awful lot that goes on in the innovation process and probably the biggest challenge is that it's actually cross-functional. So sometimes people mistake uh, the innovation process as being owned by R&D where actually it's a business process. It goes across every part of the organization. So I've color-coded the organizations here and this is a responsibility chart. So you can see everyone from manufacturing, finance, procurement, quality, all of these people are involved in the innovation process. So it's quite a complex process. What I want to do now is to go, just go into the first step and look at the pre-development stage. This is a word scatter and it's, it's very much looking at your external research. And there's really no substitute for research when you're going to bring a product to market. So there's a lot of lenses you need to look under, your countries, your cultures, your health challenges, your food trends and consumer trends, the generations, the consumer groups, market structures, supply chain formats. And if I take something like supply chain formats, distribution systems and environmental conditions is something that's very important for Ireland. Because in Ireland, product developers are very often, we manufacture in Ireland and we take the products overseas. So you need to design products that can withstand very long supply chains and tough environmental conditions. And so that's a factor that needs to be taken into account when you're doing product development. Another thing you can do as well is you can combine trends. So if you see a lot of successful trends up here on the right hand side, and we saw an example first thing this morning where you took a snack, you took a plant-based protein, um, and you combined those two, and you took gluten-free. So you saw three trends in the bar we saw in the first uh, presentation this morning. And so there's a lot of background research that you need to do, and this helps to give you some guidance in the areas that you need to look at. The next area you want to look at is portfolio performance, whether your portfolio is large or small. And it could be that you have a large portfolio that you want to review, or you have a portfolio that you'd like to expand. And so you analyze it for performance and for balance. And as a company, you want to have a strategically aligned, balanced portfolio of differentiated products, 
which are valued by the consumer and which maximize your return. Now as a large organization, you probably want to go for a diverse portfolio because you want to diversify your risk. You're going to look at what products drive your growth and profitability, things like percent of revenue from sales, products introduced in the last four years. And then you're going to look at things People often think of looking at new products, promotion products, complementary products, but often don't think about the other lenses they can look under. And one would be the number of senses that are engaged. So we heard the presentation from Emily just a short while ago, and how many senses are actually engaged in the products that you're putting out on the shelf. So the more senses you can engage, engaging an additional sense has a 20% hit. So it's really, really important to engage as many senses as possible when you're working with consumer products. Another area and many companies, particularly small to medium companies, forget about is to set their design criteria for their product developers. And your design criteria come from your food values as a company. So what do you as a company actually stand for? What are your food values? And these link straight into your brand image, differentiation, competitive advantage. I put examples up here on the right hand side of, of typical uh, food values. And I'll just take one as an example, so no artificial flavor enhancers. Lots of products on the shelf in Ireland have no MSG. However, research in the US says that it's the free glutamate in MSG that leads to an intolerance, which means yeast extract and malt extract, and lots of other extracts actually have it as well. So even though you have products on the shelf that say no MSG, you have a lot of people who have an intolerance to glutamate and are getting that from other products on the shelf. So your design criteria there, do you decide you're going for no free glutamates or no MSG? So for every single item you put on your design criteria, you need to be specific and give this guidance back to your designers because of the direct relationship with brand image. Another area I just want to touch on is the whole area of packaging. And packaging is the first point of interaction with the consumer. And a consumer can already have decided that they're not going to repurchase your product based on the, the experience that they have with packaging. And sensory or taste, where everyone spends a huge amount of, of time in PD, is the last of your senses to actually engage with the product. And so you need to think about how a consumer engages with the product from the time they go in merchandising, interacting with it on the shelf, taking it home, reusing it, disposing of it, etc. And so it's really important that you think of the consumer supply chain, not just the manufacturing supply chain. And the one area I want to talk about just a little bit is consumer interaction because it is an opportunity area for Ireland. So in one of my workshops on consumer quality, I'll cover 11 areas and I just want to touch on a few of those now. So if I went out with my consumer lens, and these are all Irish, um, taken from the Irish marketplace, I would fail all these products from a consumer perspective. Top one on the left, you need to have um, print that all consumers can read with ease and assist in making an informed choice. So this was obviously a manufacturing decision, so what you saw here is you want only one SKU and you put all the languages on the label, but now the consumer can't actually read the label. The next one here on the right is very typical of what our milk looks like in Ireland. Um, and this one would fail on ease of opening. So seals that all consumers, whatever age or strength, can open and reseal with ease. It's a dexterity measure. And both the cap and the pull tab would actually fail. And there's a lot of background data to say, uh, support this. 81% of seniors say easy to open is an influencing factor to purchase, compared to 58% of 25 to 34 year olds. Now 58% is still a very high figure, and that came from one of Board B's healthy aging reports. Same in the UK, uh, half of the over 65s and one in six of the under 40s find it hard to open everyday items. So if you're looking to differentiate, packaging interaction could be an area you can differentiate. Now if everyone on the market is the same, and I think in Ireland, well, certainly in Cork, it's very hard to get a milk that doesn't have this uh, cap on it. But if everyone's the same, it doesn't really matter. It's if somebody makes a change or sets themselves apart that you can swing the market. And this is what the multinationals do really well. Next one on the left failed on two counts. Seals that consumers can open and reseal with ease, so cheese pretty much fails on that. And multi-use packages that don't require repackaging at home, which is a sustainability measure. So on two counts, that one would fail. And the last one here on the right-hand side, which is the sauce, is multi-use seals that leave no food residue. And there's a lot of uh, products on the market that leave food residue. But there's a technical solutions for all of these things 
and this one is very, very easy to fix. So I've just taken four examples from the Irish trade. Why did I do that? Because if you're now taking your products overseas into markets where consumer sciences are really being utilized, US, Canada, Germany, France, then they're going to be using the consumer sciences and they'll probably win on packaging and packaging can win over consumers. The other area you need to look at is your product opportunities and I've just got a whole series of different product opportunities and looking at ideas transferable from outside the industry and earlier we saw the byproduct of one company, salt, going into a, a water product which is another very good example. So really trying to think outside the box as well on product. And so what you're trying to do in the pre-development stage is really see how can you differentiate yourself as a, as a food business. So I've just taken a few areas there to look at in pre-development. So I run workshops in-house and from time to time open workshops. And I have one coming up shortly in Port Leash around the whole area of managing innovation, which is one of the focus areas. I think I'm on time.